And now, please welcome back to our stage Cynthia Ozick and Roger Rosenblatt. And you wrote an essay recently on invisibility, invisibility in mm -hmm. the writers. And the writer is, uh, or should be, invisible, um, seeking recognition, not fame, right? Mm -hmm. um, talk about that. What's the difference mm -hmm. between, um, I mean, if, if, for example, you are recognized, that's got to be to, to allied to some idea of fame, but you don't seek it. Um, so does that make the difference? Is it the seeking of it that separates fame and recognition? Oh, I think you put your finger directly on it. Fame is pursued and recognition is accrued. And uh, it's only an accident that it rhymes, but it's kind of nice. <laughs> uh, and you can think of examples. Um, think of Norman Mailer, if you can bear it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> here is somebody who pursued fame like mad. All these shenanigans going on decade after decade. Then think of Marilyn Robinson and Alice Munro and uh, Stephen Milhouse uh, and Stephen Stern. Uh, beautiful writers who are consistent um, year after year, writing quietly, and then this recognition through the merit of the work accrues. Now there comes a time, and, and this is in the case, let's say, of, of John Updike, who also accrued 60 books by now, um, and this is done through diligence and industry and dedication and passion without shenanigans and pursuit. So there does come a time when recognition without effort becomes true fame. But they are so different that they actually clash against each other, I believe. Fiction, uh, is it uh, absurd to worry about the future of fiction uh, in a world of pictures and stories mm. on screen? No, I don't think it's absurd to worry about the future of, of let's call it, let's be fancier and say literature. Uh, and, but, but I think we do have to worry about uh, the future of reading. I think we're going to go back to the ancient Egyptians which had a, um, you know, a, a class of scribes who could read and um, everybody else was looking at those pictures so, and sculptures. So uh, maybe, maybe we are going back there, although, you know, um, these rueful predictions of uh, doom and gloom Sometimes they, they make you look silly, you know, 50 years from now. So, um, I mean, they won't make me look silly 50 years from now, but... <laughs> uh, um, no, I, well, what do you think? I don't know. I'm, the, the, uh, I don't know whether I wish for, I'm wishfully thinking, mm -hmm. um, because so many things happen so fast, and you don't believe that this could happen, and then suddenly it happens. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, where did these computers come from and your, these cell phones? You and me, babe. I don't. The, the, <laughs> you the, and me, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, babe. Wow. <laughs> but two, two non babes. The the um, uh, no, I don't use a computer, and, and uh, you thus, don't. I don't. Uh, mm. I, I have I have earned the eternal enmity of anybody with whom I work. Because if you send mm. something in, obviously they expect it that way. I don't do it out of principle. I just I don't mm. want to. Just don't want to do mm. it. The, the, uh, the power of the story of the woman who protects her, a woman in a camp, protecting her baby in a shawl, um, no longer able to give milk to the, uh, to the baby, um, accompanied by a 14-year-old teenager who thinks only of herself because she is starving, and it is natural that she only thinks uh, of herself. And is cold. And and steals the shawl from the baby. The baby is hidden in a corner of the barracks, wrapped in this shawl. And during a march, the baby is invisible in the shawl, kept against Rosa, who's the protagonist's name, uh, kept against her, her breast. Uh, but 
Stella steals the shawl from the baby. The baby then walks out into the arena and into the sunlight where she is seen by a guard who picks her up and throws her against the electric fence. And the mother, Rosa, um, has a terrifying dilemma because if she runs after the baby, she will be shot. If she doesn't run after the baby, the baby will die. I mean, there's death no matter which way she turns. Um, so I can actually, even, even as in this awkward, faltering, stumbling way, I can actually feel the, my hair stand up in the back of my neck talking about it. You had asked me would I read it, and I told you it was impossible. I even find it difficult to, to talk about, and whether that's because of the subject matter or because of my, um, my bad feeling about having written something which I made up when there are so many true stories that happened and so many survivors still among us who keep those stories going. Now, I think it's very important for us to make that distinction between fiction and nonfiction. I think it's absolutely vital because, uh, uh, and, and this was the theme of the play I wrote, because of Holocaust denial, which has declared that so much of this is fiction. So it's absolutely imperative to know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. The, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch government had to turn itself inside out with chemists and all kinds of, of um, testing to prove that the paper on, on the diary was real, that the ink was real because of the Holocaust deniers. Now, I, um, th this is really the most vital thing we, we can do with our minds, which is make distinctions between, to know that one thing is not another thing and that fiction is definitely not nonfiction. It's terribly important. Will you join me in saying how grateful we are to this great writer? Thank you. Thank you.